So welcome to our fourth lecture. Today we discuss about rheology. And what we'll do, uh, you at least you now have a perspective on why we need to discuss these physical aspects. Because in structural geology, people try to understand the formation. Uh, so the response of rocks to uh, stress, yeah, to differential stress. So we try to, to understand the formation and to understand how are you going to describe the deformation of a rock. So that's why we are gonna study rheology, especially in the case, now we, we are focusing on that case where we see that rocks appeared to flow, yeah, to flow, although they are solid. So we need to use some models, some models. Models are simplified versions of reality. They, uh, they divide reality into kind of compartments that we can grasp and then we can combine them. So uh, I'll show you the need for these models of behavior when it comes to rheology. And then the basic models, you see elastic, viscose, plastic, already you get an idea the, how we combine them. And then we'll, I'll show you what the deformation experiments show because we cannot witness deformation in the middle crust, for instance, uh, we for two reasons we cannot get there and we don't have time to do it because this happens over geologic time. So we do experiments in laboratory and we learn from them about the the way materials respond to stress. And from this understanding, we under we we extrapolate and understand the rheological behavior of the whole lithosphere. Yeah, this is what happens. That's the way we approach things. Now, if you were to go in and into the engineering and study uh, material science, a lot uh, of the content of, the, of the information that you will get in, into material science will be more or less along the, uh, the lines that we are going, going to discuss today. Yeah, a lot more. So, what I put here, I copied, it's the first page of the chapter uh, on rheology in the Fawcett textbook, but I want to explain a few things here uh, to see where we go, because it tries to give you a perspective. So we discussed about stress and we discussed about strain and we know they are related, not necessarily very in a very simple way, as we saw at the end of uh, last lecture. Um, however, the response to stress, which is a strain, yeah, <laughs> depends on the properties, yeah, on the properties, physical properties of the deforming rock, which I think you agree with that, yeah. So now, these properties, and here is where the complication come, uh, comes. They depend on physical conditions. So these properties actually depend on the state of stress, depend on temperature, depend on strain rate, uh, depend on the presence of fluids, yeah? So sure. this is, yes. For example, some, mater some material uh, could be elastic or plastic, depending, for example, on, on temperature. Yes, you'll see in a bit, sure, sure, Gabriel. Thank you. Um, yes. So what happens is that um, you see what Fawson says. He says a rock that fractures at low temperature may flow at higher temperatures. Yeah. Um, and here is the idea of strain rate. What is strain rate? It's the rate of deformation. Yeah, if you want the the speed of deformation. Now, geologically speaking, it is very slow. Yeah. So. Think about this. Uh, you might have a rock if, and you can see that it flowed. You see the folds in it and so on in geologic time with a slow strain rate. Now, if you want to impose a, a fast strain rate, so fast, uh, very rapid deformation, you hit it with a hammer here at the surface, it will break. So mechanically, it will behave differently. So, um, Let's go into this, and we uh, we are approaching this with an example that probably is intuitive to you because you have seen images uh, of 
the glaciers, yeah, the glaciers, everyone discusses about glaciers, that they are melting or whatever, but you have seen images of that. And when you look at these images, you see that the ice, yeah, that the ice obviously shows features of flow and the glaciers do flow, yeah, they, they, they do flow. So they accumulated, the, let's say it's a mountain glacier, um, it grows at the top where it, it snows and it flows and it melts at the base somewhere. So the idea is that with time, the, the ice flows, yeah? But, and you see features of flow, but if you take a piece of ice now, you get a big piece of ice and you wanna put a cube of ice or a piece of ice uh, in a, a glass of scotch, for instance, yeah? You want to do that. You can take a hammer and you break the ice. Yeah, the idea is the ice, you don't impose a very slow strain rate, like a, a stress there that with time will make the ice flow. You basically impose the same stress, but very fast. And you impose this very fast deformation and it breaks. All right, so that's the idea. Now, we have a field that is called the rock mechanics and the civil engineers will study a lot uh, and the geotechnical engineers will study a lot of rock mechanics because they are uh, concerned about the conditions at the surface of the, the earth, yeah? So here things break, mostly. So rock mechanics deals with the brittle aspects, yeah? Uh, brittle behavior. Whereas rheology and continuum mechanics describes the flow of rocks, yeah? The flow of materials. So that's the, the, the idea. When we talk about rheology, we talk about flow, yeah? Uh, so flow means the strain is accumulated gradually, yeah, gradually. And you don't have fractures. You don't have the formation of fractures because it flows, yeah? So the deformation is at the microscopic level, yeah, at the crystal level. We'll see what happens that creates this uh, type of deformation without discontinuities, without fractures, yeah? So, um, as Gabriel wanted to uh, uh, point out, yeah, you see, it says the effect of temperature is the main reason why flow mostly occurs in the deeper parts of the crust and not in the upper crust, which is cooler and uh, rocks tend to fracture. Teacher, yeah. sorry. Yes. May I ask you, is yes, kind of hard for me to understand how mm -hmm. can you accumulate a strain? It's like a type of force that can be accumulated? Yeah, so no, the, the strain is the effect of force. So force is, stress is related to force, yeah? As we discussed, strain re, uh, represents distortion, yeah? Uh, so it's part of deformation, strain. How you accumulate it is that, uh, for instance, I can take this napkin and I start de deforming it. And now it is a bit of strain here and more strain and more strain and more strain and, and more and more and more and more. Yeah. So this is for a rock. Imagine that the rock starts to flow in the middle crust. So you start creating a fold. Initially, let's say you have a horizontal marker. Initially, you create something like this. And this, then with the accumulation of strain, it goes like this and so on. So that is accumulation. Okay. Of All right. I understand. Yeah. But the flow itself does not have like the sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, like vectors, like we. Oh, yeah, about. sure. I mean, of course. But there are two different things the cause of deformation and the formation. Yeah. So when we talk about stress, what you're referring to the principal directions yes. of stress, we are talking about the cause of the formation, yeah? Okay. Whereas the formation is the effect. But there are many factors, as we saw, that condition the relationship between the cause, which is a stress, and the strain, which is the effect, yeah? That's the idea. And okay. we have to understand how these things happen. Yeah, sure, David. Thank you. You are welcome. All right, so here is another example. This is, uh, uh, I think, uh, taken from the textbook. So what this shows, it shows that the border between Norway and Russia, it shows this outcrop, that means a florimento, yeah? And 
this um, uh, this type of phenomenon that you see here is called budinash, and these are called budans. But that doesn't matter. It's, this is not the idea. Uh, the idea is that you can imagine that uh, this could have been initially a continuous layer, but then with the formation, this continuous layer was broken into these segments and the surrounding layers of a different rock kind of surrounded these segments. So what happens here, I'm trying to convey to you the notion of competency. Yeah, you, you, hear, you can hear, oh, this rock is more competent than the other rock. What it means, it is a relative term. Yeah, it is a relative term that tells you the resistance of a material to flow relative to another material. So you can say this material is more resistant to flow than this material. So this material is more competent than this material. So in the case of rocks, this rock, the dark one, is more competent than the white rock here. Yeah. So you see, this is these are gneisses, very old gneisses from the Archean. Yeah. So the gneisses have this gneissic bending, gneissic bending, which means a separation of the dark minerals like uh, mafic minerals and felsic minerals, the white, whitish, light colored minerals. And these layers uh, with the formation, uh, the, the one with, which was more mafic, turned out to be more competent. Uh, to resist more flow to flow, yeah, to oppose flow, if you want. Whereas the other material, the lighter rock, kind of flowed, yeah. So what happens? You have here a competency contrast. And if you look at this, at this, um, you know, scale, if you want, like if you have sedimentary rocks in general, the le the least competent is the salt. So the rock salt, yeah. That's why the salt layers, yeah, salt layers, sodium chloride. That's what we eat. We put in our food. The, the salt layers, they don't stay typically in sedimentary basins as horizontal layers. They will rise up as diapirs because they are less dense yeah, than the material above. So they tend to form these diapirs, but this, they form it by flow. yeah. So that is what happens. So the so salt is the least competent. And then you see shale, limestone, and so on. Dolomite, which is uh, calcium, magnesium, uh, combination of calcium, but has to have magnesium carbonate. Yeah, Dolomite is the most competent. So uh, it, it, can, it kind of opposes flow. Now, when, we, when it comes to metamorphic and igneous rocks, you see, the schists, marble, uh, quartz, ignite, granite, basalt. Yeah. So increased competency. Yeah. Uh, this is the most competent, the basalt. Yeah. So that's the idea. Now, here is a note. A note the note says uh, when you say it's competent, it doesn't give you a measure of the amount of strain, yeah, of the distortion or deformation in a body. Yeah. Uh, it is just a relative term. You compare one material with another material in terms of which one flows more easily. Yeah. So it's just a relative term. All right. Now we have to, I, I said here, the need for rheological models of behavior. You will use in your professional life, you will use a lot uh, the words brittle and ductile. Fragile and ductil, yeah, and that would be, I think, in uh, uh, Spanish. So the idea is that here is a bit of a confusion because brittle, when you look at this gra uh, graph, you, you have an initial rock. You can imagine this as a rectangle and with a marker, a diagonal. So you create a fracture, a fracture, yeah? You fracture that block, yeah, of rock. And you can say that this is brittle behavior, all right? But when you look at this, look at this end term, yeah, at this end term, the deformation here is very clear. 
it is the deformation happened here only along this fracture is very localized along the fracture and it became a fault because there was movement along the fracture so the deformation here is very localized in the brittle behavior the ductile behavior how are you going to describe the ductile behavior what is this i mean you can see that there is deformation here obviously the deformation is distributed yeah it seems that there is a certain area in this block of rock that was affected by the formation not here and not here yeah at the top and the bottom but somewhere in between there is an area that suffered the formation so you will say first the deformation is distributed yeah the second thing that makes you call this ductile is that you don't see any fracture yeah you look at you look at at, at this uh, rock now and you don't see a fracture you don't see a fault so you don't see a discontinuity all right so here is the problem the word ductile refers to the situation when you look at the rock you go to an outcrop and you see that the deformation is distributed so there was this deformation in the rock but you cannot see any discontinuity yeah any discontinuity so it is it seems that it's continuous and then you say it is ductile behavior the problem is that when you start looking with a microscope or in detail so not with your eyes without a magnifier without something that shows you there are different mechanisms for this distributed deformation and for instance you can have many small fractures yeah many small fractures that actually had a, a little movement along each fracture and to your eyes in the outcrop it appears that the deformation was continuous but when you look at uh, with the microscope for instance you see many small fractures so actually it is in fact the mechanism of deformation was brittle but the behavior as it appears to you with your to your eyes it is ductile so it's not a very clear term so you are gonna say well uh, this rock appears to have suffered ductile deformations and someone will ask you okay it was ductile but are you sure it flowed or it, the deformation was uh, was actually um, taken by small brittle uh brittle um deformation features and you cannot see them all right so that's why people uh should use the the um, these words brittle and plastic yeah because then it's very clear when you know what happened it's either brittle deformation with faults and fractures and then uh even you if you see them or you don't see them you know what the mechanism is or it's plastic deformation where there was flow so there is no loss of continuity yeah that's the idea so let's look now that i gave you the introduction here you have some definitions yeah so you see brittle behavior that means response to stress and as an effect the rock loses continuity or cohesion yeah so you are going to see uh, at, at different scales you are going to see the fractures and the faults yeah now ductile you see it's a general term yeah and the rock appears to flow so this word is very important appears mesoscopically mesoscopically means as if in an af in a naflovimento yeah in an outcrop to your eyes without using a magnifier a microscope or something that helps you see exactly what happened there so the idea is that it appears to your eyes that it flowed but you are not very sure if it was real plastic deformation without loose loss of continuity or actually was a brittle deformation yeah so here this graph shows you very clearly these things we have something called structural style so you are a geologist you go to map in the field and to your eyes you look at the outcrops at the aflorimentos yeah and you can see in this aflorimento i can see brittle deformation 
and in this one, ductile, but in turn as a as a style of deformation, yeah. But when it comes to the mechanism of deformation, you see micro scale mechanism of deformation, micro scale. What happened there? Then you can see that you go from brittle to plastic. So in this field, let's go through these four stations. Station number one, you are here, yeah? The structural style is brittle. The micro scale mechanism is brittle. So this is what happens. So you see it in the outcrop that it is fractured and faulted. So it, it, there is a loss of continuity. You look with the microscope and you see that the mechanism was frictional sliding. Yeah, so that's what happened. So here it, it's everything very clear. Now let's go to two. It looks to your eyes that is ductile. You don't see the loss of continuity of cohesion. But when you look with the microscope, yeah, you see that actually the deformation occurred on many microscopic, on many microscopic fractures. So the the, the actual mechanism was brittle, yeah. So the structural style is ductile. That's how it appears. But when you look in detail, actually in reality, the physics is brittle. Okay. Now, this happens obviously in the upper crust. Now, three, three. You see three here. So it appears to your eyes that it is ductile, and you look with the microscope, and indeed you cannot see fractures, faults, and so on. So obviously, this rock suffered a plastic mechanism of deformation. In solid state, somehow those crystals flowed. Yeah? So they kind of uh, rechanged uh, change themselves, accommodated the flow. Yeah? So that's the idea. Now you can understand why it is very precise to say this rock suffered deformation by plastic mechanisms. And then everyone knows what you are talking about. Or you can say, well, I saw an outcrop and the rock appears ductile. But we are not very sure if the actual mechanism was plastic or brittle. Okay. So if you understand this, you will not make any confusion. Yeah. That's the idea. Uh, as, as I can say, it relates to our perception of things. Now, here is the thing. Here is from a different textbook. I, I, I chose uh, two images here. So you see ductile deformation. You see this marble layer. So it was bent, uh, bent here and it pinches out. So variations in, in, um, in uh, thickness and so on. So when you, are, you go in the field and describe this, you say, well, this marble layer suffered uh, you know, it appears to have a ductile style of deformation. Um, if you look at this outcrop, you clearly see here some layers that were folded, yeah, were folded. So here there is no question. You are looking at a brittle style of deformation, yeah, no. So the conclusion of the author here is, he says that we can use brittle and ductile when we describe what we see, okay? But the idea is that this doesn't tell us exactly what happened there in the rock, yeah? So that's why we need to use these models of behavior. Did the rock behave in an elastic manner, in a plastic manner? Did it show viscose behavior and, and, and so on? So that's why if we want to be more precise, like physicists, we need to use these models of behavior. So let's look at these models. First, the, the basic ones. You all studied physics, all right? So in physics, you take these very simple situations. You all studied about springs yeah, and pistons and what happens when you pull, uh, pull a body yeah, and the friction and all these things, how, how, how you exceed the frictional resistance, yeah? So these very simple mechanical models, they are basically what is shown here in this column, 
the same thing is expressed here yeah, in an abstract way. So if you look here, you all understand elastic deformation, elastic. You all in physics studied about springs, yeah? So the idea is that you can describe the behavior with this graph, yeah? And with this graph, you see on this axis, the stress and on this axis, the strain. And you see the linear relationship. And this, uh, this is a Young's modulus. That's the name of this. Um, so that shows basically the slope of this, uh, of this function. And depending on the slope, one material can be more stiff, one less stiff, yeah? So, so basically it, it is more stiff, so it, basically it's kind of harder to deform it elastically or easier, yeah? So th this is a very simple relationship. So you see, you apply a certain stress, so this is a thing, you apply a certain stress to the spring and you get a certain deformation, yeah? And in time, what happens, the moment you apply the stress, the moment you apply the stress, you get the strain. And the strain stays like that up to the moment you release the stress. And being elastic deformation, it is non-permanent strain, non-permanent. So basically, the spring recovers. So I think this is a basic model of behavior. We all understand very easily. We all played with springs, so we know this. Now, this <laughs> pistons, yeah, this, this thing. Now, you know, uh, the cars have these things. They have uh, both springs and, uh, and pistons here. But, but the, the piston here is filled, yeah, this, um, this uh, uh, room, let's say, is filled with a, a fluid, yeah? So basically, you want to pull the piston. So uh, the fluid has a certain, what we call it, viscosity. So to describe the flow of fluids, we need this parameter, we call it viscosity. So think about honey, yeah, like meal. You know, you have the jar of meal and it can be very viscous and it takes a some time for it to flow. And some people, uh, you know, they have the um, Ig Nobel Prize uh, given by Harvard University, uh, uh, similar to the Nobel Prize, Ig Nobel Prize. They give this prize, they, it's, it seems like a joke for, for pieces of research that are very serious pieces of research but they seem like funny, you know, in a sense. So for instance, one year in physics, the, the prize was given to some Australian uh, scientists who had a certain material like tar, and they wanted to study experimentally the flow of the material. So this material had, had a very high viscosity, so it flows very well. So they wanted to see a drop forming and how it falls. So they had to wait about 20 years for a drop to fall, yeah? So it's kind of funny. I mean, come on, you wait tens of years to, 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 to basically uh, experimentally study the, uh, the flow of a certain material. But it was a very serious piece of research, yeah? So this is what happens here. So wh wh what you see here, you see, the stress, and here you see the strain rate, yeah? Because once you apply a stress, yeah, basically it keeps moving, yeah? It keeps moving. And depending on how big the stress is, yeah, how big, uh, it will move faster or slower. So this is why we have to look at the strain rate, yeah? Here is just the strain, here is the strain rate. So it re, uh, the relationship is between these two. And if you want to look in time, once you apply the stress, you start moving. And let's say you move up to T1 and you stop. But this will not go back. It will stay there. So the deformation, the strain in this case, is permanent. Yeah, it's permanent. So this is a very ideal linear uh, viscous material. All right. So now you can see that all this can have relationships, relationships, mathematical relationships between these parameters. So what happens is 
These are called constitutive equations that describe the behavior of a certain material. So now here is perfectly plastic, perfectly plastic. So what happens here, you have a mechanical analog. Mechanical analog is just an analog for our mind to understand. But plastic deformation means something like this. First, you need to, to have a certain level, a certain level of stress, yeah? In a fluid, starting from, from zero stress and you increase a bit, you will see, still see a bit of deformation, yeah? You start deforming. But here you have, you have to have a certain level of stress to create the deformation. So basically the mechanical analog is this. You want to pull a, um, let's say you want to pull a box. You have to exceed the frictional resistance, yeah? Once you exceed it, you can pull it. So the, you see the perfectly plastic material, once you get to a certain value of stress, which is called the yield stress, yield stress, you start moving, yeah, in this mechanical analog. So you start deforming. So again, you have a strain right here. Now, for the plastic materials, you have a more complex constitutive equation, but that's the idea. And it's permanent strain. So these are basic models of behavior, yeah? We want to use them to understand how a certain material behaves. And here is elastic behavior, yeah? What I was telling you, depending on the Young's modulus, this is stiffer, this is not as stiff, yeah? And here are some behaviors like linear elastic. So you pull and when it, it goes back, it goes uh, like this. This is called perfect elastic. You don't have to, you don't have to memorize these things, but you have to, to see and understand what happens, yeah? There are, the material behaves a bit differently. And most materials will, will have this, it's called elastic behavior with hysteresis, which means you see it has one path of uh, going, like when you load it and when you release it, it goes back a different path. Doesn't matter. It's just as an example, yeah? That we go from a very ideal model and then the reality is a bit more complex. So we are trying to, to get closer to reality. Yeah, that's what we are doing. So viscose, yeah, viscose behavior. So I've shown you this strain versus strain rate. And this describes a viscose behavior, ideally. But, but in, in general, as you, you can see, uh, we can have an instantaneous uh, viscosity, basically. Uh, it says the nonlinear curve has a gradual change in gradient, yeah, which is called, yeah, the, or effective viscosity, yeah. So that's the idea. Some materials behave like this. Some will behave like this, yeah. So material scientists study these things. So if you are to study in engineering material science, you will have a lot of these things and plus equations and all these things, yeah. Now we don't do these things. We, I just want to give you an idea. It's an introductory course and so on. All right, now plastic behavior, we discussed it again. So basically it's permanent change in shape or size. Yeah, there is no fracture. Yeah, uh, and you have a, a sustained stress. Yeah, which is beyond the elastic limit. That's the idea. So I'll show you in a bit. These are the basic models. Now what we can do, the rocks and other materials are very complex. Yeah, they, are, they don't behave just in one way you have to combine these ba basic models, yeah? So let's look at this. For instance, this combination, uh, a material behaves elastically up to a certain point, And that point is called the yield stress, yeah? Yield stress. So this is elastic deformation. And at some point, uh, at a certain level of stress, it starts deforming plastically, yeah? And then it deforms plastically, it accumulates the uh, strain, yeah, up to a point when it breaks, yeah, it's called the rupture. Now, ideal plastic behavior looks like this. So it is elastic and then ideal plastic behavior like this. Now, what you see here, yeah, here, it's called strain hardening. So what it means is that as you, uh, 
try to accumulate strain here, you have to increase the level of stress. So some materials have this strain hardening. You take a wire of copper, you bend it. You, you, then when you try to bend it back to the initial position, it's more difficult because the material hardened. Other materials, they soften. So you see, once it starts deforming plastically, you no longer need this level of the stress. You can decrease the stress and you continue to deform it. Yeah. So this is the reality. This is how different materials behave. So what happens is you apply the stress, keep, keep the stress of, uh, uh, applying, and then the stress is gone. The elastic deformation is going to recover. So the actual strain will be this one, the plastic part. Yeah, The elastic one is going to recover. So you can apply the stress and keep applying it, applying it up, up to the point you break the rock. Yeah. So this is mechanical behavior of materials. Yeah. We are discussing these very abstract things, but you can understand that we need to understand what happens to the rocks. So this don't get scared. This is for you to take your time a bit. Yeah. And look at these combinations of this mechanical analogs, for instance, what happens if we combine a spring yeah, with a block or, or a piston with a block or all these combinations. So various materials have behaviors that can be described by these mechanical analogs. And if we were to use mathematics, they would be described by these functions, as you see here. And these materials have different names. You see, this would be called a, an elastic plastic material or Prandtl material. This would be a, a, a Bingham material. This would be a Kelvin, a Maxwell. You don't have to remember them now. You don't have to, you don't think that you have to memorize. What we try to do is understand the behavior, like, like be able to, to logically understand the combination of these models. Okay, so you'll take the time, you can read these things and uh, kind of contemplate these graphs. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, the, uh, under the banner that rocks basically are rheologically complex and generally do not behave as perfect elastic viscose or plastic. So to understand the behavior, we have to do these combinations of these models. That's the idea. All right. Now, for the last part of the uh, class, this dry class, um, <laughs> yeah, we will discuss the following thing, experiments, yeah, the formation experiments. The only way for us to actually witness what happens with, in the process of the formation, yeah, how, how is the evolution of the formation, is for us to do experiments. Now, when we do experiments, we have to do them in a lab and we have to do them much faster than the geologic time because we cannot do an experiment in 10 million years. We have to do it in a matter of days, yeah, so that we can, uh, you know, obtain some results and disseminate them and so on. Like those researchers, they did their experiment over 20 years, but still within a lifetime, you can take the risk and wait for some years and do the experiment. Anyway, it's much less than geologic time. So this is a shortcoming. So we have to basically extrapolate from something that we do in a very short time and understand what happens much slower in a long time. Yeah, that's the idea. And these experiments, uh, a standard way of doing it, yeah, um, you have what's called a triaxial rig. Triaxial rig means an apparatus where you put a sample, which is a cylinder. Usually it's a cylinder. And around the cylinder, there is a metal jacket. Yeah, a metal jacket because um, you have to have some control on this sample. You don't want it to go uh, in a, a certain direction. And you apply a, a triaxial rig allows you to apply three stresses, yeah, three stresses, uh, principal stresses. Now, in many experiments, they apply a principal maximum stress, like sigma one, and then they apply 
uh, confining pressure is called. That's why it's PC, uh, which means sigma two and sigma three equal, equal, and the same all around, yeah? So imagine that you simplify a bit. Sigma one and sigma two and sigma three are equal. So this is like a confining pressure. So basically you apply a certain pressure to, to the sample like this, that's confined pressure. And then you load the sample, yeah, you load it. And you create a differential stress between sigma one and the confined pressure. And eventually people try to understand how rock fails, yeah? Uh, uh, how, how a rock fails, yeah? At what differential stress it will break. But before it breaks, there is some plastic deformation in the rock, yeah? Or we can call it ductile deformation. At some point, there are fractures that develop and so on. So we want to understand that. So the idea is, you can see, people do experiments of two categories. They either impose a certain strain rate, so the rate of deformation has to be constant, or they impose a constant stress field. Yeah, a constant stress field. So let's start with the constant stress field. Yeah, these are called creep experiments. Now creep is a word you can have the soil on a slope in with time it flows. And that is called soil creep. Yeah, so it flows down slope. So this creep is like a slow deformation, yeah? A slow uh, deformation. That's why we call it low strain rate deformation. So we impose a certain differential stress and we wait for the deformation, for the creep uh, in the sample. And what people, when they do these experiments, they observe these uh, phases, these regions of deformation. So it's plastic deformation, yeah? So it's plastic deformation. And initially you have a, 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 a region that is called primary creep, yeah? So you, you see that the, the basically the, um, the deformation rate decreases, like the slope decreases. Initially it's high and then it decreases and it stabilizes. And then you have a region is called steady state creep. So basically the same uh, kind of rate of deformation goes in time, yeah? So, and finally you have a third region where actually the deformation rate increases, yeah? The, the rate increases as you can see the slope, the slope of this curve. Because then at some point you develop fractures and then those fractures coalesce, yeah, they link one to another and you create a rupture in the, in the sample. So basically they submitted the sample to a certain differential stress and waited for it to go through, through all these stages of creep uh, until uh, up to the point that it ruptures, yeah? So that's what happens. All right, so this is what happens also with with ice, yeah, it, it flows, the flow of ice is creep, yeah? So basically what you see here is uh, the material has to be at a high homologous temperature. Now, homologous temperature, yeah, is basically, you see the ratio of the material's temperature relative to the melting temperature, yeah? In the Kelvin scale, that's the idea. All right, so, now you understand the, the creep. Now from the other textbook, no, sorry about this. Um, I don't know what to do with this. Um, all right, so the idea is that the other textbook shows you the same information. It shows you that here you have a, an yield stress where you start having plastic deformation. You see the three regions and you see the fracture, yeah. Maybe you don't get uh, you don't get to the fracture because if you stop your experiment early enough, early enough, this is basically the elastic deformation, the elastic deformation up to the yield stress. You have elastic deformation, it recovers, and then this is a permanent strain, yeah? So this is what people do to learn about rocks. Now, here we talked about 
a multitude of parameters that come into play. And that's why this discipline can be very, very complex and complicated and so on, because you have to take into account many, many parameters. And one of them is temperature, yeah? So what happens with temperature? This experiment here, and this experiment here, and this experiment here, it shows, you see, this shows, uh, basically it shows it, it, it took a marble, yeah? So marble is the metamorphic product as a result of uh, thermal metamorphism of, um, of limestone, yeah? This is marble. Now, this marble has a foliation in it, and depending on, on how the foliation, the direction of foliation is relative to, you know, the loading or, or the stress direction, yeah? They did these experiments. So basically, they do these stress strain experiments. And what you can see, as you increase the temperature, yeah, as you increase the temperature, the yield stress, the ill stress where you start having plastic deformation decreases, yeah? So basically, you will start having plastic deformation uh, at a lower stress if you have the high temperature, yeah? So you can imagine as what happens to the rocks when they get deeper and deeper and deeper, yeah? So that's what, what the increase in temperature does, lowers uh, the yield stress, yeah? All right, so, um, and lowers the ultimate rock strength, which is the differential stress at which the rock fractures, yeah? That's the idea of what it does. Uh, okay, now, what happens, what happens if we, um, oh, one more thing, what, it, uh, as you increase the temperature, the ductility increases. So you see here, basically, at a lower temperature in this experiment, the fracture happens here, yeah? Then at a higher temperature, for, uh, the fracture, you can deform more the material and more the material and more the material. So basically you lower the yield stress, but the material behaves uh, in this plastic manner, yeah? For, uh, um, it, it can accumulate more strain, yeah? So it's uh, basically, a, accumulating more strain until it fractures. So this is the effect of temperature. Now, people did experiments with the strain rate, if they impose a, a slow or a fast strain rate, yeah? So basically what happens is, if you increase the strain rate, like here, you increase uh, the strain rate, yeah? Increasing the strain rate, you increase basically the yield stress the stress at which the rock starts to flow. And also when you decrease the strain rate, people saw that basically you increase the ductility. So that's why I gave, gave you that example. The ice can flow if the strain rate is low and it will break, yeah, it will not be ductile if you hit it with a, a hammer, fast strain rate. All right. So here is, let's see what this is, uh, the effect of the confining, confining pressure. So confined pressure, you remember, is when you load the sample, you put sigma two and sigma three equal, and that's the confining pressure. And you see for at 25 degrees, at 25 degrees, different confining pressures, yeah? Uh, and here at 400 degrees, what happens for different confining pressures? So, yeah. So as you increase the confining pressure, yeah, as you increase, so you see the increase in the confining pressure here, you have more strain accumulation before failure. Yeah, as you can see. So basically, for uh, um, the rock can take more deformation as you increase the confining pressure. Yeah. Um, however. However, there is a problem. If you have fluid in the pores, yeah, then the effect of increased confining pressure is actually counteracted by the increase in the pore pressure. Yeah? It's like the pore pressure acts, counteracts 
yeah, acts oppositely to the confined pressure. Yeah, that's what it does. So I'm giving you these things not to confuse you because I know how it feels for you. I mean, even for me, it's kind of, I have to focus and say, well, what is this graph showing and so on? I want you to have an idea and understand why structural geology has this reputation of being kind of a challenging field because by its nature of what it investigates and tries to understand, you have so many variables to take into account. And you see some of these variables are opposite that you have to do so many experiments with varying these variables to understand what happens in different situations. Yeah, that's the idea. So I want you to get the feel for it. All right, so uh, as I mentioned about the, the, the poor fluid pressure, you see the results of the experiment. What happens if you increase the, four fluid, uh, the poor fluid uh, pressure for the same confining pressure, yeah? So you will have time to look at these graphs, yeah? You don't have to remember them. You don't have to memorize. All you have to do in this course is to understand what the graph shows you, yeah? To understand what you have on the uh, on one axis, the other axis, and what's the parameter, yeah? That's the only thing. And then you understand, you understand when the rock starts to flow, the yield stress and so on, yeah? That's the idea. All right, finally, finally, because I know it is a lot, I want to get you back to geology, yeah? The geology is, we are very much interested in the understanding how the lithosphere behaves, because the behavior of the lithosphere allows us to understand tectonics, allows us to understand what happened that we have the Andes here, yeah? Or we have the Himalayas in Asia. What happens that we have the, the oceanic basins and so on? So we want to understand the behavior the rheologic behavior of the lithosphere. And that's why many people have studied and have done experiments and have done this kind of work, which is not very exciting. You must like it. You must like the material science to, to go into this branch. So that finally, we put together the knowledge we acquire for the behavior of different rocks and of different min minerals, monomineralic rocks, and then, by using this, we can extrapolate at what happens at the level of the lithosphere. So let's look here for first, yeah? And I'll explain what this graph shows to you. This is depth, this is depth, yeah? And this is differential stress. So differential stress, yeah, is what matters, yeah? The difference between, the, between sigma one and sigma three. But in the case of the experiments, is the difference between sigma and the confining pressure. Yeah. So the differential stress is what matters, what leads to the formation and eventually to, to, to uh, the breaking of the rocks. And here, people studied what happens for monomineralic rocks like quartz, feldspar, and olivine rocks. Yeah. So when it comes to brittle strength, yeah, I, I've shown you um, um, a graph when we talked about differential stress, and I've shown you where a certain rock breaks. There is, let's say, this law, yeah, this function describes the brittle strength uh, in general of the lithosphere. Yeah, we can have an average. What's the brittle strength of the lithosphere? That means what it, when it breaks. But what happens with the flow law of the lithosphere? Because at a certain depth, certain temperature, rocks flow. So if the rocks are dominated by quartz, this is a quartz flow rate, uh, flow law. If they are dominated by feldspar, this is a feldspar flow law. If they are dominated by olivine, this is the olivine flow law. So this is very theoretical, like in physics. Now, let's translate this into the lithosphere. So what happens is, 
it is considered that quartz is a significant mineral in the upper and middle crust. It is a component of the rocks, a very important component of the rocks, and that it is considered that quartz will dictate the rheological behavior of the lithosphere in the upper and middle crust. So then if you combine this and choose from here, you say, okay, for the upper crust, the temperature is low. For a while, rocks will behave in a brittle manner. So they will break when the differential stress at different depths reaches these values, yeah? According to this, this function. At some point at a certain depth here, we get towards middle crust. The rocks are still dominated by, by quartz. But here you see the strength of the rock is decreased because it starts flowing. So it, 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 you, at a lower differential stress, the rock starts flowing. It doesn't have to break. So the rocks here in the middle crust will start flowing. And that's why when you look at the gneisses, you see these very nice flow features, yeah? Now, you, after this lecture, I think you start seeing what happens. For a while in the upper crust, rocks break and we see all these faults. Then at some point, temperature takes over, yeah? And basically this law takes over, yeah? And rocks start to flow. Then the lower crust is considered to be dominated by feldspar, yeah? As a major com constituent of the rocks in the lower crust. And then actually what happens once you reach the lower crust, basically rocks will flow according to the feldspar flow law. And as you can see, you need very little differential stress deep in the lower crust and rocks flow down to the moho well the moho is a big contrast it's a big contrast in terms of physical properties and in terms of chemistry or mineralogy because you get into the mantle and the mantle rocks are dominated by olivine all right so here once you get here for a while there will be kind of a brittle strength for the mantle. You see the mantle will behave in a brittle manner. And then at the intersection of these two curves, the olivine flow law will take over. So this is what's called the rheological profile for the lithosphere. It is a model and the model varies from one point on the earth to the other because actually, you know, there is a lot of variation in what we call the upper crust, what we call the middle crust, the actual rocks in them and so on. But we have a strong and good model. The only complication to this model that you are seeing here, you see dry and wet. The lithosphere itself, it is stronger if you look here, if it's dry and it is less strong if it has fluid, yeah? I just sh I've shown you what happens when you have the poor the the fluid pressure, yeah, um, component taking over. It decreases basically the strength of the material. So what happens here? If the lithosphere is wet, you have one rheological profile. If it's dry, you have a different rheological profile. All right. So I know it's not easy. Believe me, I know, so I uh, don't worry about the test. All I want to know to, to see in the test is that you understand the idea, okay? So, so as long as you understand what these graphs show, you are fine, yeah? Don't worry about it. You will read it in the textbook as well. Um, and now at least you, you learn something very, very complex, but important in this lecture you learn that actually we, we human beings, after many, uh, uh, many efforts of trying to understand nature, 
we can have a model of how the lithosphere behaves at different levels. And then we can understand why we see the gnistic features, yeah? All this flow of the rocks and so on, which seems impossible to us. How come that rocks flow? All right, so this is, this is the lecture for today. What I want you to do is read in both textbooks, in this one, chapter five, in this one, chapter six. But here's the thing, read in all sections, the parts of the text that are related to these slides, yeah? You will see equations, you will see kind of mathematical expressions. Don't worry about them. If you like it, go ahead and read them. But don't worry, I, I'm not expecting you to write equations and do these kind of things. No, I just want you to have a, an intuitive understanding of what we discussed, yeah? That's all I want from you. All right, so um, this is a lecture for today. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please ask them. If not, uh, have a good afternoon. Feliz tarde, feliz fin de semana. Don't stress, communicate with me. I will post the details in CQA Plus, all right? So, uh, gracias a todos. Y uh, nos uh, uh, vamos a comunicar um, uh, en CQA Plus. Gracias. No, thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, brother. Have a good day. You, uh, thank you, David. <laughs>